Okay, everybody, in this video, uh, we are talking about late Roman missile weapons. Now, when you talk about the missile weapons used by the late Roman army, um, and in this context, I'm largely going off of the work of the scholar by the name of uh, Stevenson, and in doing so, I'm taking his date range. So, what Stevenson defines as late Roman is typically what we think of as like the late Roman Empire, like, you know, the 4th century, uh, definitely into the 5th when the Western Empire collapses, and moving forward from that into what we would understand to be like the early phase of uh, the Byzantine chunk of, you know, Roman history. So approximately, I don't know, 300 to like 500, 600 of that approximate two or three hundred years. In that period, as Stevenson classifies them, and from what I can tell, this appears to be accepted with a bunch of other scholars too, the late Roman army used approximately seven kinds of missile weapons. Pelums, and uh, some variants of them, javelins, plumbata, franciscas, slings, bows, and my personal favorite, uh, which we'll be getting a dedicated video, the solenarion. This one looked like it was used in the mid to late 6th century, uh, at least that's when it shows up anyway, as far as I know. Um, and this is described as a bow with an arrow shoot. So maybe a kind of early crossbow, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, but like I said, that will be getting its own video once I do more research on it. Now, the classic image of the Roman legionary, of the Roman army, is of soldiers hurling their javelins, their pila, and then closing uh, with short swords. So, the Gladius. The late Roman army still does this, but they threw javelins and darts, like the Plumbata, as well. And then they usually, not always, but usually close with spears, although swords, uh, like the Spatha, were still also used. So we've got seven weapons. That's a lot to talk about. So what I want to do is break this up into a couple different chunks. In this particular video, we're going to be talking about... Uh, the Pilum and its variants in late antiquity. So, to start, it probably would be a good idea to mention the writings of this guy, uh, Vegetius. So, Vegetius wrote this book, Dere Militari, and it is supposed to have been like this military tract that uh, was presented to one of the Roman emperors. I think it was Valentinian II, don't quote me on that. But my point is that when he's writing this tract, what he's doing is cobbling together bits and pieces of information about how the Roman army was effective in the past and how the late Roman army needs to return to those traditions, etc. And in writing this, he's talking about multiple kinds of weapons. The pilum he talks about. Once you do the conversion from Roman units into uh, metric units, the heads are about 222 to 296 uh, millimeters in length. Okay, so that's just a textual description. However, the good news is that we have some archaeology, specifically from a site up in South Shields in the UK, where we've uncovered late antique heads about 290 millimeters long. So his description largely appears to be correct. But the problem is that in the text, if you get like a modern day translation, um, you might see Pilum. You might see that word. The word that Vegetius uses, it's not that. He uses a different term, spiculum. So that begs the question then, uh, what's the difference? The short answer is we don't really know. It's a bit of an academic debate as to, you know, whether or not the spiculum is the same thing as the pilum or if it's just a new weapon. It's not really clear, but I'm using both interchangeably in this video because you will see in a bunch of books and a bunch of articles about this stuff, Academics and professionals tend to use it, you know, slightly interchangeably. Now, in addition to the spiculum, we also have two other types of weapon like this. The angon, which possibly uh, has Germanic origins. From the research I did for this video, it almost certainly does. But, you know, then again, I could be wrong. I haven't read all the books and papers on the late Roman army. Although it's not for lack of trying. So I could always turn up something new about this. If I do, I will update the video on the channel. Um... So we have the Angon, and then we have this other weapon. It's a group of spears called the Swanton Group B1. Now, I'll talk more about that in a minute. So the Angons, these were barbed, thrown missile weapons 
um, not unlike other weapons of that general type. And like I said a minute ago, it's entirely possible these things were developed uh, in free Germany. And at this point in me talking about this, I should have thrown up an image of what the Angon actually looks like, because we do have surviving examples of it. But regardless of whether or not it was actually developed in free Germany, it was adopted as a throwing weapon by the late Roman army, and as the barb suggests, once you hurl the thing, it's designed to penetrate shields. Maybe if you get lucky, armor, but it's, it's designed to penetrate shields up and then bend slightly, like the pilum, so you can't remove it. The barb is going to lodge itself in the wood, and the shield is, at least in theory, rendered useless. Now, before we move on, I just want to do a brief note on the names here. So, if you read um, late antique sources on military history, you're going to find this weapon referred to by two different names. In specifically late Roman sources, these are called gazums. But in, you know, Frankish or otherwise um, Germanic sources, otherwise Germanic contexts, they're written as angon. They refer to the same weapon. Now, the other weapon I want to briefly touch on before I end the video uh, are the Swanton Group B1 spearheads. Okay, so that's a mouthful. What does that even mean? So, Michael Swanton uh, is a British academic, historian, linguist, and archaeologist. He's a bit of a polymath. His thing is Anglo-Saxon England. He's well known for doing a bunch of work on Anglo-Saxon literature, uh, notably Beowulf. But his importance for this video lies uh, in two publications published in 1973 and 74, respectively. The Spearheads of the Anglo-Saxon Settlements and a Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Spear Types. Now, as those titles might suggest to you, they're all about Anglo-Saxon spears. I have not read the second volume, but I have read um, Spearheads of the Anglo-Saxon Settlements. If you are interested in this topic, I would highly recommend you read it. Now, in them, what Swanton does, okay, is he looks at as many of the Anglo-Saxon spearheads as he possibly can, all the way from the early migration period, when Saxons are raiding the coast of Britain, and, you know, in Roman sources this thing crops up, uh, the Count of the Saxon Shore and the Saxon Shore Forts, which refer to the series of fortifications along the Channel Coast designed to uh, protect against Saxon pirates, so from that period in the 300s into, like, the 6 and 700s. And again, he's trying to classify all these spearheads, and in doing so, he classifies an early chunk as quote-unquote B1 spearheads. So, the B1 spearheads, and unfortunately I can't find any good images of them, uh, but they are in the books. These measure between about 18 and 30 centimeters, so specifically they look, and to a degree they function, um, as if they're designed to not only pierce shields, but to punch through body armor as well, and into the body. The heads are certainly long enough uh, to function as weapons in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but they're also short enough to function as thrown missile weapons. So, with that, we've reached the end of the video. That was my, you know, brief spiel on this subject. Hopefully you guys found it interesting, and if you want more information, definitely check out the books and papers that are listed in the bibliography in the video description, and check out those two books by Swanton. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you all next time.